Okay, just while our, our panel members are getting seated, um, we'll begin to uh, do the introductions. Um, it's Kira Koto, I'm, I'm Phil Edgar, I'm the manager of digital collections here at Papa, um, and I've been pr very privileged to have been the chair of the NDF board this year. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the NDF sector leaders panel. Um, this is a new, th new thing for the NDF conference, so we're, we're trying it out this year. Um, one of our key goals as a National Digital Forum is, of course, to foster cross-sector collaboration. And one way to do this is to facilitate conversations amongst our sector leaders, um, amongst those that are shaping our, our digital strategies and our organisational strategies. So on NDF's 15th birthday, um, this seemed like a great opportunity to bring together leaders from across our sector to hear about their organisation's current strategy and thinking and to discuss how they see digital transforming their organisations now and in the future. Our host and facilitator for this session is our final keynote speaker, Keir Winesmith. Um, and as this is Keir's first um, opportunity to be on stage, I'd like to introduce Keir to you now. Keir is a digital leader and strategist working across web, mobile apps, virtual and augmented reality, SMS and in-building interactives. With a focus on developing unique and meaningful digital experiences, he's led and collaborated on many award-winning projects over the last 15 years. Currently, Keir is the head of web and digital platforms at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and co-founder of the SF MoMA Lab. Keir holds a PhD in new media and degrees in computer science and physics. He and his work have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, San Francisco Chronicle, National Public Radio, Australian Broadcasting Service and Wired Magazine. He writes and speaks about the intersection of digital culture. And perhaps if you could join with me now in just welcoming Keir to New Zealand and to the stage. And I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, we are very, very grateful um, to, to a number of leaders giving us their time today to be part of this panel session. Um, working from left to right, we're all seated in the right order. Alphabetical by surname, we have Heather Baggett, the Group Manager of Delivery for the Ministry for Culture and Heritage. We welcome Rachel Esson, Director of Content Services from the National Library of New Zealand. I've got the order wrong now. <laughs> Moving one back, um, and Rebecca Alvey beside her, um, Chief Executive of Nātanga Sound and Vision. We welcome Melissa Firth, who hasn't had to come far. She's the Chief Digital Officer for the Muse Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa. David Gamester, um, we welcome you to, um, to New Zealand, um, to, to Wellington, and to your first um, National Digital Forum Conference. Um, it's great to have you here from the Auckland War Memorial Museum. And finally, Anthony Moss, uh, Director of Government Record Keeping at Archives New Zealand. Welcome. So uh, how the panel will run? So we're going to have each um, a five-minute presentation from each of our panel members talking to their institution's current strategy. Um, and I, I realise that's quite a big ask to sum up um, strategic direction in five minutes. So a bit of a challenge there. Um, from there, um, Keir will pick up the conversation and build in questions that we've sourced from, from you um, during the conference. And we do hope also that there'll be an opportunity for a couple of questions from the floor at the end of the session. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker to the floor, and that's Heather. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to be here, thanks very much. I run the delivery group at the Ministry for Cultural Heritage and a number of my staff are here in the audience today, lovely to see you all. Uh, the emphasis of my presentation will talk broadly about the Ministry's strategy and purpose but a bit particular em emphasis on the work we do in the delivery group. We are, are the, the public face, if you like, of the Ministry. Do I have a clicker? Excellent. If you can cl click again. Lovely. That would be handy. Thank you very much. So uh, connections. Uh, con connecting people with culture, the cultures of New Zealand, of Aotearoa, connecting through storytelling. This is what we do at the Ministry for Culture and Heritage. Uh, we create, we make, and we support uh, connections with and through both digital and physical platforms. Uh, we connect people across communities and cultures, seeking to reflect the diversity of views, uh, perspectives and traditions. Um, and we do this to promote a confident and connected culture. That's our purpose. Uh, confident in who we are, uh, knowledgeable about uh, our history, our heritage, 
to be invested in it, to be proud of it and proud of our heritage, confident about our place in the world and confident about our future. Uh, so our goal is to connect more people uh, with the culture of New Zealand and especially to connect what we call the unconnected, uh, those who are vulnerable or disadvantaged in our society and or whose important perspectives are not well represented in the New Zealand uh, narrative. Uh, we connect people with uh, places. Uh, this is the uh, National War Memorial Park, Pukiahu. So places that are important to our nation's history and, and also to our future, uh, that both embody and shape uh, who we are as New Zealanders. Uh, at our National War Memorial Park in Wellington, we're seeking to connect a broader audience with our military heritage, but also a national expressions of citizenship and commemoration. Uh, in the 1930s, if not aware, probably um, one of the first national crowdsourcing projects, our National War Memorial was opened and more than 10,000 people attended that opening ceremony on Anzac Day in 1932. Uh, New Zealand's population at the time was one and a half million. Uh, today, uh, an average of 76,000 people visit Pukiahu each year and in the 2015 um, Anzac Day commemoration as part of the World War I centenary, over 40,000 people attended. So we uh, connect people uh, across time and place as well uh, with the ancestors uh, to understand and appreciate their genealogy, the generations who have given service to people and to this country, those who have protected and nurtured the rights and opportunities and legacies we enjoy today. Uh, so these are stories that we research, we research with others, we support research that others do, and we share them. Uh, we partner with others to tell their stories. So we're in the storytelling business. It's a uh, privilege we share with all of you here, uh, and our focus in the ministry is on stories about our national identity, our whakapapa, stories about diversity, views and stories um, that connect people with our unique um, Māori heritage and culture. Our audience is broad, ranging from school children to new New Zealanders uh, and to veterans and their descendants. Uh, we facilitate events and experiences to promote storytelling and to engage communities and commemorations like this one coming up in 2019. Uh, we engage communities and uplift the stories that they wish, wish to share. Um, we like to think we give uh, voice to stories that people might not otherwise hear but need to be heard and shared. We also fund and monitor a range of um, agencies, some of which are, are here today, and we administer uh, contestable funds that support the expression of New Zealand's culture, creativity and identity. We capture moments of uh, history, powerful snapshots of our evolving culture, which resonate with New Zealanders uh, wherever they live. Uh, we also care for some of our uh, nation's treasures of our uh, Tonga. We look after national icons like these, our flag, our national anthem, coat of arms. Um, these are all important to all New Zealanders who are born here, those who migrate here, past, present and future generation, generations. Uh, stories that express who we are as a nation. I'm getting the time nod here. Our digital platform is where we connect the most New Zealanders, a broad audience. We've seen a 10% increase over the last four years in these various uh, websites that we support. We now have over 10 million visitors each year uh, and a lot more through our social media channels. We've refreshed our digital strategy recently um, to place digital publishing at the centre of our public engagement activities. And to inform the strategy, we undertook some face-to-face uh, audience research. In short, it told us that our products are trusted, they're credible, they're relied on by a wide range of users, including students, teachers, librarians and lifelong learners. Uh, but to keep pace in a crowded marketplace, we need to diversify the subjects, um, the viewpoints and the type of material we publish, with an increasing emphasis on co-creation with communities and producing rich uh, media experiences. So here's a bit of an example of how we're doing this. This is our Titai Treaty Settlement Stories project. We've partnered with Iwi Like Ngātiawa to co-create and co-fund their settlement journey narrative. And our aim here is to use our multimedia formats to engage a wider audience to strengthen public understanding of the treaty and the settlements process for um, the benefit of Iwi and of New Zealand. 
Uh, we're also partnering with the Ministry of Education, which means this content can be used for the education material and curricula, and we're looking to produce the two-level content as well. If I could just go back and play that video clip. Look, this wasn't just yesterday. This was a few hours ago in the grand scheme of time that all of our land here, from Waitahanui down to the Haaparapara River, including Te Whanapanui, Ngaitai and Whakatohia, was confiscated because of the actions of probably three people who had killed uh, Falo James Falloon and some of the crew of the cutter Kate. Because of that action, all of our lands was, were confiscated. And I just couldn't understand that, having studied law. And it just struck me as being completely unjust and wrong on any basis. So that's how we plan to connect more New Zealanders through storytelling to promote a confident and connected New Zealand. Thanks, Heather. Let's keep going. Kia ora tato katoa. My name's Rebecca Alvey and I'm Chief Executive Tumu Whakarai at Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision, New Zealand's audiovisual archive. Um, we are in the digital game, uh, whether we like it or not, um, and uh, fortunately we like it. Um, and that's because uh, increasingly, as most of you will be aware, um, almost all audiovisual content that's created today is born digital. So for us, a decision to be digital or not be digital was never really an option. It was going to happen, and the question was how are we going to go about it, uh, and how are we going to make sure that we were um, doing so in a sustainable, effective, and um, long-term uh, uh, way to ensure that we weren't taking a lot of steps now that were going to ultimately prove to be um, flawed or fruitless in terms of those technologies and um, formats becoming unavailable at some point in the future. So for us, the themes of today's panel are really, really poignant um, sustainability in the sense of the pathway, the technology pathway that we choose is an incredibly um, important strategic question that we have to ask ourselves and regularly re-ask ourselves to make sure that we're on the right path. Um, so with most AV material being born digital today, um, that does two things for us. One, it makes our job uh, more um, challenging in the terms that there's a, a great deal more material being produced. So. Um, in the old days, uh, people made films and it was, a, it was an event and people dressed up. If I'm talking about home movies, people dressed up and it was a very important occasion and it was expensive to do. And those films were kept and they were kept safe and they were tucked away somewhere um, and they were bought out on special occasions. Um, today, we get out our cell phones or our you know, mini um, video cameras or, or um, sound recorders and anything is captured, everything is captured, a lot of it is probably relatively low value, and the trouble is it's all intermingled with the things that are incredibly valuable and important pieces of our nation's heritage. So one of the things we have to grapple with is how do we make sense of that? How do we make sure that we are able to um, educate the creators of that content about our role and how we can help um, to make sure that those precious taonga are captured? Uh, and um, to do so in a way that's really easy and inexpensive. Um, the other upside, I guess, of, of material being born digital these days is that it means that our role in sharing and making that content available is a lot easier than it used to be. Um, certainly our organisation and its predecessor organisations gained something of a reputation for being quite hard to get material from for reuse, regardless of whether that was a commercial reuse or a not-for-profit reuse or just a family who wanted to see Nana um, who had been on television or had been in a film or an advert. Um, but uh, digital material, obviously, you can share it, you still have it you're not losing anything. So we see huge benefits um, in, in being in a digital space. But it's also a cultural journey for us as an organisation. So those same um, archival instincts that wanted to keep material safe and out of the, the hands of prying eyes and, and other people, um, they still exist. That is still how some of our um, very, very talented and very professional um, archivists think about the work that they do. And many of them are still handling the physical objects as well as the digital. So how do you start taking your team on a journey that says sharing the material isn't actually going to harm it. It's something we should be doing and we should be do doing it more and more often. Um, 
I know we're on sh short time frame, so that's probably the main things for me. Um, storytelling, though, clearly a theme for us as well. Um, we, that's the business we're in. It's, it's, it's uh, <coughs> fictional stories and it's non-fictional stories and everything in between. Um, sometimes they get a bit muddy in the middle. Uh, and it's absolutely what gets our staff up, staff up in the morning. It's that ability to connect people with their stories, to connect whānau with their, um, with their tūpuna, uh, it's it's a phenomenal um, industry to work in, and um, we love it. So thank you. <coughs> Can you pass the? Yeah. Thanks. Kia ora, kia ora koutou. I'm Rachel Essen, um, National Library, and I'm already hearing some uh, themes that are coming out. Um, the National Library and I are the same age. It's a bit of a confession. <laughs> And like the National Library, uh, there is more information um, about me on, available online. Um, this, the caption from this is uh, it's from the Nelson Photo News, April 1966. There, I'm really giving it away. And it reads, Jim and Angela Essen and little Rachel have come to Nelson from Wellington. Jim's an entomologist with the DSIR. This has been digitised and made free, freely available. Um, I, I just put that in because it is that connection that we've been talking about and that connection to Fano and the information that's out there. Um, but getting on to the National Library and our strategic directions, turning knowledge into value is what we're calling our strategic directions. We're looking out towards 2030. And there's a very worthy statement there that talks about um, creating cultural and economic value. Um, we consulted widely throughout 2016 um, with stakeholders, with other public libraries, researchers, and we distilled all of the feedback into three strategic themes, taonga, reading, and knowledge. And as we worked to develop these themes and understand what they encompassed, it became very clear to us that they were integrated, connected, and they reinforced each other. And I think also we've heard today that um, other institutions have similar themes, again, that would be integrated, connected and reinforcing. Um, the, the motivation or, or some of the discussions that we've had was about wanting to solve real world problems and that value wasn't just economic value, but there is a whole range um, of understanding and definitions of value. Improving literacy to boost social participation is a really important um, aspect of what we're looking to do. And the issues of social cohesion and connection, which have already been referred to. Um, just going very um, quickly into a little bit more detail about each of the themes. Taonga, New Zealanders will trust that their documentary heritage is collected, protected and accessible. Um, we're wanting to really develop some more formal frameworks of who's collecting what. Museums, libraries, universities, we want to identify the gaps, reduce duplication and leverage specialist infrastructure and for example digital preservation, something I'm sure is close to um, the hearts of a lot of us here. One of the really um, aspirational things that we've got in the um, strategic work programme under um, Taonga is looking at large scale digitisation this um, physical knowledge resources that all of the ones that are important will be digitised. We won't be doing that on our own, so we will be looking to partner. Um, reading, uh, we know that there's an issue in New Zealand with functional literacy, and we think that um, there's a role for libraries, for museums and galleries to be able to help with that. Reading for pleasure, digital literacy and digital inclusion, and te reo Māori revitalisation are all things that we're looking at working on under that strand. And, and knowledge, and this is really about connecting New Zealanders, connect, make, removing some of the barriers to accessing knowledge. We know that sometimes our institutions make things hard to find, and then when you find them, it's not always easy to use them. Um, so we really want to work to do that. There's a little bit. The um, other thing that I'm particularly interested in is the concept of collaborative ready practitioners. 
Um, I think we really need to focus on developing a workforce that has the skills and the mindset to work together, to work across our institutions and around the country. In healthcare, there's this concept of collaborative ready practitioners. They've been doing a lot of work about how do you actually develop a workforce that can work across professions, so doctors, nurses, dietitians, physios. And the research shows that you get better health outcomes um, for your community if, if those practitioners understand how each other works. And I think in the sector that we work in, we should be doing better in terms of that. Um, I'd like us to think of ourselves like a perfectly functioning New Zealand health system, um, that we're working together to achieve the best outcomes for New Zealand. Thank you. Sorry? Wait a minute, please. Okay. okay. Do not talk amongst yourselves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, kia ora tato. I'm Melissa Firth, uh, CDO at Te Papa. And uh, I've got just one slide today, which is this um, uh, Southern Cross. And um, we've recently encapsulated our strategic narrative um, as a Southern Cross, um, rather than a North Star, which you sometimes hear about. We've been on a journey of renewal for the last probably two and a half, three years, and that journey of renewal will continue over the next five years under the new Chief Executive, Geraint Martin. And that renewal covers everything from, uh, from renewal of the building and sort of facilities, um, the, to a sequenced renewal of our permanent exhibitions, to a new conceptual framework that we're putting finishing touches on for the next five years of, of programming that docks back into the original concepts um, you know, from which Te Papa was born 20 years ago. It also covers investment in digital um, over the last couple of years and also um, looking at uh, how we streamline our back of house processes and, and systems so that we're being you know, efficient and, and sustainable in what we do. The digital strategy um, for Te Papa, I guess, it does not stand apart from the objectives and the purpose of Te Papa across that Southern Cross of past, present and future. Um, and so we, when, we, uh, when we designed it a few years ago, we were really thinking about how do we add value to the museum and amplify the impacts across each one of those dimensions. So, um, so in the past space, for example, you know, w digital is really about increasing use of and access to the collections by people, and again, it's about connection. Um, some of the things we've done in that space already include um, upgrading our collections online platform with an API and, and setting up an accelerated um, digitisation program. Um, in the present space, that's obviously about audience and, and participation, and I should say that that circle in the middle there of people, um, people and cultures, is, is the, and biculturalism is sort of the central basis on, on which Te Papa was built and makes Te Papa so different from, some, from so many museums in the world. So that the, the, the present aspect of that obviously is about exhibitions and learning, um, invigorating our learning programs and our events. Also how digital experience feeds into that and, and creates new connections that are relevant and engaging um, with the public. Um, and, and also using channels like, our, like online and social, um, as some of you may have heard Michelle speak before, increasing awareness of, uh, of what we have and what we hold um, that is going to be useful and valuable to the public. Uh, in the future space, that is about, um, talked about this before in relation to mahuki, the future is emergent, so it involves conversation and collaboration between people, and mahuki is one um, side of that in terms of, uh, of how we have um, invited in creative industries around Te Papa and all of the knowledge and assets we have and ways that you know, generate new value. Um, but also the work of Te, Papa, Te Papa's NSTP team, sort of sector development, iwi engagement, all of that really fits in that future space. How do we work together? How do we create a safe place for challenging conversations and, and really dock back into that notion of Te Papa as a forum for the nation? At the bottom of that Southern Cross is sustainable business. And, um, 
uh, again with digital, um, the sort of third pillar of our digital strategy over the last few years, and this won't go away, is how do we use the transformative um, properties of technology to increase the effectiveness of what we do, whether it's you know reaching more people, whether it's creating scale and in, in, um, in what we're able to put um, to put up in front of the public, whether it's um, whether it's collapsing the time needed for a back of house process. And some of the things we've been doing there include things like um, an experience delivery platform that has halved the amount of time it takes us to create interactives um, on the floor. Um, a digital asset management system that will make it easier for the storytelling folks in the museum across marketing, comms, exhibition experiences to, to find assets and, and use them to tell stories you know, faster and, and in a richer way. And I see that um, in the future going sort of more towards actually how we underpin every aspect of the museum's business with, with technology that makes everybody's lives easier. That's a work in progress. Thank you. Thank you. Um, kia ora koutou. I'm David Gamester from uh, Auckland Museum. Um, like Te Papa, we're also going through a sort of strategic reboot thinking about the future. Uh, thinking about what success looks like in five years, ten years' time. And, of course, one of our key themes and key priorities for the development of the Auckland Museum and our place in, a, in New Zealand's fastest-growing city and most diverse city is, of course, digital. And in that sense, we have maintained our ambition to be a leading uh, museum uh, in, the digital, in the digital domain. Um, I just want to quickly cover a number of key um, themes within that ambition and that strategic priority. Uh, one being um, access and openness to collections and assets. One being the creation of digital assets. Um, a third being the digital experience that we can offer. And another final one I'll just touch on very quickly, and that's about our connectivity. If we move to the... Sorry. I'll there it is. Oh, I've, I've found the right button. Um, so, um, in terms of open collections, open data, and I know that that's been um, a, a focus for conversation discussion here at the meeting, um, it's very important to recognise that uh, there's been a huge paradigm shift in the museums and galleries community internationally over the last few years. We've moved from a, a traditional model where collections access was exclusive to a position which enables open digital uh, access as a default. And the Auckland Museum is a leader in this democratic process and we will continue to push the boundaries for the benefit of communities for research and education. Um, to enable audiences and our communities to make connections and find meaning in our assets, we will invest further in our public interface and enabling a deeper interrogation of our images and data, including the whole process and practice of developing community knowledge and sharing knowledge, creating new content that's a shared enterprise with our knowledge holders around the community. And that is something I think that distinguishes the Auckland Museum's content from many others. Um, we want to be seen as a leading digital museum in terms of that visitor experience. Um, that is um, now going to be um, accelerated through our big investment capital program investment around our galleries and our facilities over the next few years. A huge multi-million dollar investment in um, far greater exhibition space, um, um, more galleries, but a really enriched and improved um, digital um, overlay um, supporting and accelerating understanding uh, uh, of those collections and those displays. Um, that, I think, is an interesting area for discussion. It's about how we innovate um, new digital interfaces and how we adopt um, existing ones to find the right formula for what we want to achieve in terms of sharing our knowledge and in the uh, creation of new knowledge around our assets. Um, we're also thinking about how we use the digital to enable people to create a stronger and more effective visitor journey, both in terms of orientation and wayfinding. I think um, that's a new, an enormous challenge, of course, um, when the prime, one of the primary parts of the museum business is the destination offer. And with a large encyclopedic museum like the Auckland Museum of um, 
art, um, humanities and science collections and stories, how to navigate um, a cultural journey through, those, um, through that content is uh, one focus for our digital strategy and that'll be no different here at Tepapa. Um, the other final theme really is about connectivity. It's about connecting um, the assets and the stories to create new cultural journeys through the institution, both on site and online. Um, that, I mentioned that uh, digital interface there. It's also not just about us, and this is where I think the digital um, uh, asset uh, can completely transform um, the position of the institution within the wider cultural ecology. Um, you'll find that in other big metropolitan centers around the world that institutions are bringing assets together through the digital platform, um, connecting collections and stories across the city and completely transforming that visitor journey. Um, Auckland has a very rich collection of cultural institutions and assets, but it's nev they've never worked in a connected, joined up way. And uh, I think that's been at the detriment of the outcomes for Aucklanders and for visitors. And I think that we can improve that position. We can actually create for the first time through a joint digital platform, and that's what we're working on at the moment for Auckland, a new journey across the city's cultural assets, across museums, across galleries, across archives, across libraries. Anybody who wants to explore um, the Maori or Pacific culture can do that now, or will be able to do that more effectively in the next few years through that platform. So that's the commitment and that's the innovation uh, that we want to drive and this will I think enable us to really reposition and sort of um, nail that um, role of the Metropolitan Museum doing great. I'm doing great but I'll just finish uh, <laughs> it'll I think it'll reinforce and cement the role of the Metropolitan Museum um, as a as a key driver for the creation of the smart city uh, that's the big ambition. What, what defines the global city in the 21st century? Uh, and I think that museums, galleries, libraries and archives have an absolutely pivotal role to play in that definition and reforging of the global city. And we'll come back to that conversation, I hope. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Tony. Kia ora koutou. Tony Moss from Archives New Zealand. Um, we, like our departmental colleagues at, uh, at National Library, have, have been working on a, on a new strategy in the last year and we launched it in, in May. Um, not coincidental that we were working on these things roughly at the same time um, and, the, and um, I think we've produced um, with some degree of interoperability uh, compatible strategies um, with our, at least uh, our National Library colleagues but I hope um, with the broader uh, GLAM sector uh, where we interact with it. It's um, it's a, it's a very simple strategy with three, of course it's three, there's always three, three main focus areas. Um, <laughs> it's magic number, that's right. Um, we, we ran a, um, for us, a reasonably extensive consultation um, process with uh, a little bit the usual suspects when we're consulting, but, but a pretty broad process to, to really to test um, what, what should the direction of Archives New Zealand be? Did, did we, we had a pretty confident idea about our role, about where we should be heading, um, but we wanted to test it and, and well, I think, I think we were more or less on the right track because most of the feedback we got was, um, yeah, that's right, you, what you're proposing is the right thing to do, just do more of it, do it better, do it, do it in a more interconnected way, do it smarter, oh, and do it for us, please. Um, no, I paraphrase. But, but look, we've, we've ended up with, a, I think, a, a very neat uh, strategy. Uh, the three focus areas. One, taking archives to the people. Two, upholding transparency. And three, building systems together. So they're, they're a combination of things that we want to do as an organisation, how we want to um, deliver services uh, and how we're going to work together with other uh, other institutions but but with the people um, the people we serve and um, while we're in the DIA context of course we we have strong connections with with uh, library on what is what is the overlaying um, digital strategy layer because we we do already work closely together in so many areas and we want to maximize um, those opportunities for for improving delivery 
Um, so what, what are they all about? Taking archives to the people. Uh, pretty self-explanatory on the face of it, but it's quite big. Um, it's about getting government information, government records, and public archives um, more readily accessible uh, for a wider, ever wider group of users, promoting what, what we do and what we can um, provide to uh, users of archives uh, and gearing up uh, as an organisation for growth in our physical and digital holdings. Um, now, uh, you would have noticed there, it's not just archives, it is government information. Uh, so it's current records and archives that we're interested in. Likewise, uh, upholding transparency. Now, that's a key uh, component of what archives as an entity does under the Public Records Act. And um, we were encouraged to see um, pretty strong support f for that role um, amongst the stakeholders we consulted. Um, it's, it's reinforcing our intent, not surprisingly, to fulfil our statutory role, um, <laughs> to support open government principles um, and, and to enable government to be held to account uh, through the creation and maintenance and accessibility of full and accurate records. Um, that's, that's at the heart of what we, of the function we perform uh, as Archives New Zealand under the Public Records Act. And so we are, um, in upholding transparency, we are, we are looking to our archival holdings um, of historical material, but we are looking out across the whole of government, uh, the, the public sector very broadly defined. Um, the third leg of the, of the strategy, building systems, Together, um, that's just a way of working uh, that we we want to follow, and realistically, we need to follow um, the investment we all require for for new platforms, for pushing information out and making it accessible it uh, accessible to the people is always going to be huge, and uh, it's obvious the more we can work together, the better result we'll get. Um, Sorry, I just thought that was a really great summary. I didn't mean to. Keep going. Oh, thank you. Also, you've run out of time. So, there's <laughs> Sorry, do you want to? I didn't mean to cut you off. I That's just thought you were like. So, a tiny bit of housekeeping. I'm going to pour a glass of water and I'm going to go stand over there. And while that's happening, everyone who's in the wings, could you come in? And if you're right on the edges, could you let the people who are sitting on the stairs and kind of stuck, could you let them through? So, come in and off the wings, everyone. Come and make some room if you're right on the edge there. Um, and then we're going to get into the questions. All right. Thanks, everyone. The first to the this is sort of to the whole panel, um, as people are sort of settling in. You weren't able to see uh, Minister Curran's. I don't think everyone's able to see Minister Curran's um, opening address yesterday. She touched on a few key points that, for me, as um, as an Australian working in the U.S., I wasn't aware of and wasn't really looking at. And I'm curious. I think it opens for us a door to think about how the glam sector is going to interact with government going forward, but also how the glam sector can take advantage of this moment that feels unique, um, but it may be just that's my reading, but also this, this environment and having worked in the US and Australia and in Europe, there is things about New Zealand that the rest of the world cannot do. Your lack of states, your functional government, um, relative wealth, high education. <laughs> I live in America, functional government. You have a functional government. Um, so I think that opens, offers some opportunities. And there was something that she talked about a number of ways about, and you've, a lot of you touched on this, this notion of collaboration, of working together. And in the museum sector, especially in the US, uh, consortial efforts have almost all failed. The wreckage on the side of the museum consortium road is, um, is replete uh, for the last 20 years or so. What is different about your institutions? What is different about this moment? Or what is different about your practice that means that you will be able to collaborate effectively and create, um, what was the language that was used, new cultural journeys for New Zealanders in this moment? Um, I'm open to anyone to start to address that. 
I'll, I'll, um, I'll just uh, uh, suggest that um, I think the key, the key thing about consortia is that they, they are not over-engineered. Mm. In the US, I think the US experience has been to create very heavy architecture. Um, and I think we need to move towards business collaboration and partnership, joint venture collaborations, uh, which support um, both or more parties to, say, develop their audience, to get cross-visitation, to um, reach parts of the uh, ecology that they haven't yet uh, got a stake in. Um, so it's really about finding light touch, business-driven, um, quite focused initiatives that mm -hmm. can get r real value. So short, sharp interventions, um, no heavy architecture. Um, and the, the thing about the kind of government, sort of all local government situation is that you're always, you're, there's always a tendency to move towards that kind of architecture. And I think if you, if you to look at um, how the tech sector works and business innovation works, it doesn't work like that at all. It's mm. business driven joint venture and that's how it works and that's what we need to learn. Sorry, I think you had something you wanted to throw on that and then I'm going to ask about staff. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say, um, from the National Library's perspective, um, in terms of our strategic directions and delivering those, what is different is that we're recognising the resource that it requires to collaborate well and looking to actually um, to shift resource to be able to do that. So we're looking at the collective impact model and recognising that you need to have a backbone uh, and that is you know, deliberately um, focusing on developing a shared agenda um, and actually having the, the resource to, to drive that, um, to have the reporting and to do all of the work that goes along with it. I think often what happens is that you think uh, collaboration just means a few meetings and then stuff will just happen, but actually it's work and you need to recognise that and you need to fund and resource it. The, the catch cry within the, the work that the government chief uh, digital officer does and, and his staff do in the Department of Internal Affairs is centrally led, collaboratively delivered. So it's, it's, it is a catchphrase and um, you say, you talk about backbone, Rachel, I sometimes think we do need to have though a bit of backbone. I put my regulator hat on quite enthusiastically. So, sometimes there is a place for regulators to set rules um, sometimes there is a place for regulators and central bodies to uh, provide shared services that can be taken up because there needs to be a leadership role. And I think thinking about the New Zealand context, that, context, that will often be central government just because we have uh, such a strong central government mm. and less uh, well-resourced other layers of government. Karen also mentioned um, the idea of a, a CTO for New Zealand which I thought was an interesting turn of phrase. The, the CDO, CTO um, lifespan, I think, is reaching an end, uh, certainly reaching uh, reduced utility, certainly in the museum sector in the US. But then I started thinking, OK, so say I was going to hire a CTO for New Zealand and I was writing a job description, what would I put as the first essential responsibility? So I'm curious to the panel, if you were hiring a CTO for New Zealand and you want to make sure that GLAM's work was valued, was included in some way, but not central, but included. If you're writing that job description yourself, what would you put, what's one of the essential responsibilities that you'd like to see? Maybe you start with people who don't work for government first. Tough question, Kia, jeez. Um, I think it's interesting that it's a CTO role um, because that implies um, a lot of really the underpinnings around cyber security, you know, data, um, all, of, all of that kind of stuff. And that's really important. Um, but I think the other thing that's really important um, that can so often be overlooked is that, um, that interface with the audience and actually the experience side of it. Mm. And you know, people like Pia War. Um, it's very, it's wonderful that we've got somebody like Pia and her colleagues at, at DIA really thinking about how government digital services are um, made more human. Um, so that would probably be at the top of my list. Mm. I actually have Pia's response to this question. I'll read that out afterwards. So, um, <laughs> does anyone else want to? Um, I mean, I, th I think that one of the key things that someone in such a role would need to be thinking about is how to optimise the investment. 
because you've got lots and lots of disparate parts and clearly that's not limited as you say to the glam sector but I mean we're all making investments in, in IT and technology and digital um, infrastructure and you know we're a small country we probably can't afford to all be doing different things in different ways at different times and so having some way of capturing an overview of what's going on so that you know if we need a digital asset management um, system and we know that Tapap has just built one well let's grab that and mm. make sure that we're leveraging that investment from each other and and being f flighty and agile and and ideally getting ahead of the game so that if we need a few different things in ours than Te Papa does, then we've thought about that at the, at the development mm. stage rather than mm. after the fact. So that, that ability to look across and look for those opportunities to, to leverage investment um, mm. from the outset, I think. D David, you touched on this idea of uh, an Auckland-based but obviously New Zealand-focused um, set, of, like, set of tools but also set of practices and a set of approaches. Would it? Would you lean on government for support in that? Was that something? Do you think the Auckland Museum is placed to to drive itself? Um, the interesting question about whether we would ask government to support um, a metropolitan institution like the Auckland Museum. I think there's, there's another conversation, um, but um, because it would break the paradigm, um, maybe digital will do that. I don't know. That would be very interesting. Mm. Um, but um, we are we are ploughing for we are forging ahead, um, focusing on innovation and actually exploiting and building on the platforms that we have created and invested in. Mm. So we are going to create a digital cross search platform for Auckland, uh, using our own assets um, and investment um, as the basis for that. Um, so I mean I think a lot can be done with existing resources. It's just the strategic collaboration that's missing. Um, so we need to get that right. And I think a lot can be done. Um, it doesn't need to be the full architecture. It can be an, um, a, a gradual and staged approach. Uh, but we need to get some quick wins. And we need to do some more prototyping. We need to be more experimental. Uh, we need to learn from practice. And I think that's what we're committed to. Um, you know, and I think that there's a lot that we can be doing with um, institutions outside our own sector as well. Um, a lot we can learn from, um, um, from industry and we need to invest in um, infrastructure that enables incubators and startups to work with us in a more effective way. Mm. Um, um, you know, I think we need to rethink um, some of the existing models for how we um, develop as an institution and that will become increasingly, I think, a collaborative one but based on mutual business interests. Mm. So I think we can do that in a city like Auckland mm. um, and I'm excited to, to explore that possibility further. It's, um uh, a cheeky plug here for my talk, which is going to cover a lot of that ground. Um, uh, I'm going to read what Pia said. She suggested that the CTO would need a function to, to bridge across sectors, to create collaboration opportunities and a, a room for experimentation, keep abreast of emerging tech, and then obviously with her government hat on, um, support democratic engagement for all. I'm thinking... Um, Heather, if you could talk to what you would like to see in such a role, and then we're going to move to questions of sustainability. If I agree with the comments that have been made about um, having a bit of a strategic map of what actually is already underway and where those gaps are, and uh, how do we bring everyone along on that journey? So mm. someone who can look across and see where those opportunities are to leverage what already has been invested, mm. um, where the quick wins uh, can be, and, and beyond the technology uh, solutions as well. So, so what are the um, fresh ideas about how structural other reform and change can facilitate um, that working together and being collaborative in that approach? Because mm. we are a small nation mm. and um, you know, we have to use our investment wisely, but in a way that really matters and is going to make a difference for New Zealand. Hmm. I think there's a lot that museums in the, in the GLAM acronym can learn from libraries and archives. And I'm curious, I mean, in thinking about sustainability, the sort of big themes that have been coming out when I look through all the questions on Twitter, when I look through the questions that came from the board, the sort of three epochs of um, digital transformation. And I haven't asked a lot about that because I think you've all covered it pretty well. Um, sustainability was really key and then thinking about inspiration and, and sort of uh, an eye to the future. On sustainability, looking at libraries and archives for answers or uh, approaches, there's a sort of common adage that every technology system you build 
you spend 10% of your time looking after it, tending it, making sure it doesn't fall over. If it's two institutions, five institutions working together, they're all spending some amount of their time tending it. When, when the Library and Archives thinks about these systems that they want to syndicate and they want people to adopt, how do you, how do you bake in sustainability into your kind of strategies and practices? Certainly from our perspective, because of the, the volumes of data that we create, um, we have to be thinking about um, the, the lifetime cost of digitising a title. So it used to be that when, when a preservation effort was, was made, a conservation of a physical object, you got to then put it in a vault and what you were paying was the power bill. Um, now you're paying the power bill because you still need to keep your LTO tapes in a climate controlled vault. Uh, fortunately they're a lot smaller. Um, but you then have to bring it out every few years and migrate it to the next format of LTO tape. And so you're entering into a lifelong um, exercise in sustaining and nurturing and carrying forward that data, um, multiple copies of it probably, um, through its lifetime. And so um, thinking about things in that way um, has radically transformed the way we invest um, in, in our infrastructure and our technology. Um, but the nice thing about it is it also means, well, we're here for the long haul and there are a lot of people doing similar things to us who are working to much shorter timelines. So mm. we see a real opportunity for us to be thinking about things we need to do anyway, investments we need to make anyway. Um, for example, in server farms and tape libraries, that actually all the broadcasters, all of the content creators are doing on smaller scale in little bits. Mm. Uh, and this opportunity to say, well, why should we all do it? Why don't we do it big? You, you piggyback off what we have to do anyway. Mm. Uh, and, and actually we build in that sort of um, sustainable infrastructure investment over the long term. So I think that that's really exciting, but it's also a big leap of faith, because what we would be saying is to the TVNZs and the RNZs and the TV3s of the world, don't build your own, mm. use ours. And they are used to being, even more so than any of us are, completely independent, standalone commercial entities, that mm. would less so for perhaps for RNZ. But um, you know, obviously, they don't want to be reliant on other service providers if they can help it. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting mm. discussion. And of course, for us, sustainability is also about environmental sustainability. We're running, mass, as, as are others, mm. uh, you know, massive climate-controlled infrastructure that, mm. that uses a lot of power. So. And staff sustainability, obviously, and the sustainability of the knowledge around how the systems function, I think it's to give. Tony, do you want to there, there tack on the end of that? Oh, sorry, there are interesting examples that in government, again, archives and libraries are working together on, on digital preservation um, using Rosetta, uh, the Ex Libris product, and we, um, you know, we have within our institutions thought um, about the next steps, not with any concrete uh, <laughs> decisions yet, but there, you know, there is a clear possibility there of, of presenting that offering to, to a broader market as a service, for example, and, and consuming um, consuming as a service rather than buying kit uh, is, a, is a common approach within government at the moment and there's no reason why that couldn't uh, you know, extend out into broader, um, broader sectors as well. So there's, there is potential there and I think there are models that are more or less working within government that maybe can, can be ex expanded. That can create a challenge um, at the moment though for institutions that are capital funded for projects um, mm. but don't necessarily then get um, additional operating mm. ongoing. Mm. So you know when you're coming at it from a tech angle where best practice is agile and it's nimble and um, and it's you know you, you build a minimum viable product and then you you test and you learn and then you build the next bit the classic kind of Prince Two way of, of um, funding and assuring um, projects uh, does not match that model. And so when you're thinking about, well, we've created these platforms, how are we going to sustain them over time? If you add more platforms, that means more operating. And that's, you know, in the case of a, an institution like Te Papa, where we're building digital architecture for the first time. Uh, that's operating that doesn't exist at the moment, so we've got to work out how to create the capacity to do that. And it, it, probably, it probably means actually changing the structure of the institution. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've often wondered, and maybe Pia might have a comment on this too, how the GCIO um, uh, balances that tension between actually, you know, um, tech into the cloud and and the the consumption of services as opposed to build your own, mm. and um, and actually all of the the governance processes that go along with uh, classic mm. procurement. At the at the Museum Computer Network Conference, it was in Pittsburgh. It was its 50th year. It was the 50th year of comp of sort of computation in a museum context. The the first first <laughs> the, the the program for the first one, which is in New York, you know, 50 years ago, was basically tubes. Wow, you know, like that's literally the level. And now we're talking about these really nuanced approaches to say, you know, a big theme this year was sustaining innovation. Not even what is innovation, not even does it have a place, but like how do you keep it up? And I think, um, and this is, this is turning into a question rather than an anecdote. Um, <laughs> how are you thinking about the structure of your organizations, like who works for whom and how they work? to sustain innovation, or even, like, first of all, to make it possible, but more importantly, to sustain innovation beyond simply what we just talked about, uh, you know, aligning staff. How do we make structures that, are, that sustain and create and sustain innovation so that we can be contemporary? Because we must be contemporary. Our audiences are already there. Um, so I, I gave a bit of a talk about Tapapa's innovation story at the Mahuki Showcase on Thursday last week. And I think innovation is not the preserve of mahuki or kind of one team that's off on the side doing stuff. It's actually a mindset and it's a mindset that, um, it, that anybody can pick up and that is how can I improve what I'm working on right now. And um, you know in the, in the kind of classic um, uh, model of exhibition development some of the ways to papa has brought in new innovation is by partnering. So, you know, Bugs and, and Gallipoli, we partnered with Weta on that, and that created a new way of storytelling in a, in a, in a museum space. Um, in museum education, I don't know how many of you have been to see Hinatore up on level four, but um, taking a STEAM learning lab idea and, and it really applying um, kind of creative technologies to culture and heritage in ways that engage kids in a totally different way. So that's, you know, that's come through from our learning teams. Um, our digital team um, works with, you know, everyone from, from the exhibition teams and how experience, you know, how we're going to interpret things differently um, through to experimenting with content um, in a, in a, for an audience development perspective. And I think, um, you know, if everybody actually thinks, What's, what, what can I improve in, in what I'm doing at the mm. moment? Innovation is really about intentional change that makes things better. It's not necessarily just digital. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, can I add something yeah. quick to that? We've, um, at the National Library, we've um, set up an innovation group, which is kind of cross-organisation. Um, Fiona, your convener, Fieldsend, has been really involved with that. And that is starting to um, pay dividends. But it, it is putting something very intentional in place to um, do what Melissa was talking about, which is say that innovation can happen anywhere um, and actually give it a bit of funding and a bit of space and encourage it. Uh, but the other thing I think is that environment where it's safe to fail and that's certainly a challenge within government. It's not necessarily terribly safe to fail. Um, so we have to balance that and we have to create that environment. David, six months in from a different environment, what, what are you seeing in your institution that you need to reshape to prepare yourselves for the future you've described? Smash. I have to be careful what I say. I've got several colleagues in the audience. <laughs> it's all right, you've still got a job by the end of the afternoon. Uh, no, I, mean, I, I think for us it's uh, really thinking about the future, and we've been thinking a lot in, in the process of our um, uh, five-year strategy and, 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 and really um, leading with the digital museum um, and, and the way it's transforming the museum right across all our operations from collections management, curatorial to the visitor experience and to our external connectivity. It's absolutely fundamental and we are, I mean, so it's really a sort of question about how we become a digital museum um, and uh, how we mainstream 
innovation as part of our business as usual operation. Um, and it's, yes, there will be structural change. There'll be a greater emphasis there. We'll need to think about how we manage um, all of our assets uh, as digital born content becomes an increasingly, a really growing part of our asset. Uh, that's going to change, the, I, I think, the shape of the organization as well, and that'll be increasingly visible in terms of the gallery floor experience. Um, but I think also for us, it's not just about us. It's about how we engage with our um, collaborators, partners, and our audiences, and it's about sharing uh, knowledge creation uh, uh, going forward. And um, I'm very taken by some of the uh, experiences I've already noted here in, in Australasia, which um, are really interesting in terms of um, um, bringing um, innovators and startups into the business to work with them to develop your own business model uh, and, and develop innovation together. And, and, the, and there's a synergy there. There's a, there's a, there's a really in interesting um, strategic synergy. And I'm, I've been very um, impressed by what I've seen in, in Melbourne and Acme, for example, uh, about that kind of practice, which I think is really changing the paradigm. So um, that'll be interesting for us in Auckland as we become a much more collaborative, networked sector. And that will change all of us institutionally. And that will change some of our structures. Um, so it's, it's very, this is a real tipping point for um, our sector, um, which is very exciting. And that is only in line with what I'm seeing in Europe and, and North America and elsewhere right now. Hmm. Uh, th there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. I'm curious then, given this language of tipping point, we've, uh, people have been saying like there's a rare opportunity, uh, lots of language about um, a, an available moment that, that in theory then must be grasped. In that context, what is, what is NDF's role? What is NDF's role in helping New Zealand shape this future? Maybe I need to ask NDF that. Is, that, is, is, is he or she here? <laughs> yeah. oh, may, let, me, let me ask it in a more practical sense. You have colleagues who are in the audience. Your institutions are supporting this organization and have for 15 years. You've been attending and spending money on it. Um, people are putting in hours on presentations. And, and it's a meaningful part of why your sector is more successful than most in the world. What are you hoping they get out of being here? What are you hoping they're getting out of this engagement with this group? I think the value of NDF is um, is the value that it has provided since the beginning, which is it's an opportunity for people across the glam sector to get together and share knowledge. And, and one of the unique um, things about this conference is, is actually the, the sort of generosity and openness within, um, within which learnings are shared. And um, like any community of practice, you draw energy from getting together with other people who share the same challenges and opportunities that you have and, and you know, compare notes, really. So it's, it feels like it's a good function and it's continuing well. That was lovely and, <laughs> and, and didn't help illuminate. <laughs> oh, okay. So let's talk then, then I want to spend the last few minutes we've got together on inspiration. There's a number of questions came through on Twitter and, and, and in person. So I might um, start at the near side with Heather. Looking outside of New Zealand, beyond NDF, because it's clearly a, a place that we all get inspiration. Looking outside, where are you looking in Wisdom Ministry, looking for inspiration about how you can improve your practices? I don't think there's a single um, place that the ministry as a whole looks. I think uh, across the ministry, even though we're small, we've got a number of people who are connected in various places and look to different um, countries and spaces for inspiration. Um, I had a benefit of spending a week in, in the Silicon Valley recently and um, that was an incredible experience to see what's, what's happening there at pace and how uh, some of the design thinking that's reflected here in New Zealand is actually um, you know, really helping us to understand and think through what is it that people want. You know? And mm. actually we need to really understand the customer's needs and orient, it, orient it our product and service but also our culture and our way of working in an organisation to align to that as well. Uh, for me personally, my inspiration is my kids uh, because um, they spend far too much time on their devices. Yeah. But as, I'm just really interested in the sorts of things that they pick up, you know, the, the information they take on board, how it comes to them, um, and how that facilitates conversations they have with their peers and then with us as their parents. And 
um, you know, they're the, they're the future generation, obviously, but just bearing in mind that that is happening day in and day out within our homes, mm. those of you who have children, and how um, you can take those uh, experiences and those observations to inform directly what you do in your work. So mm. you don't have to actually go and see an expert opinion, yeah. um, they're in your homes. Awesome. That's, yes, I totally agree as a parent. I'm, they break my brain. Re Rebecca, <laughs> like, w thinking, thinking also about where the rest of the world can gain inspiration from, from this community, w what do you think, like, what should I be taking back to America? Um, I, I think there are probably um, two main things. I think certainly for our, for our organisation, a lot of our inspiration comes from the collections, which um, in many regards comes from a Māori proverb which is about walking backwards into the future. So the idea that who we are and where we've come from helps us understand where we're going and why. Uh, and I think that um, one of the really precious parts of the work that we do is um, connecting those moving images with the ancestors of the people who are in them and just the extreme power and emotion that comes from that when you see mm. someone realise that that was my auntie or, you know, that, and they're no longer with us, but I can hear their voice. I didn't remember their voice. I can hear their, it's, it's quite um, phenomenal. And I think the other thing that probably, you know, we certainly don't, and as, as New Zealanders, we're also very reluctant to say we're good at something. But um, one thing we are clearly aspiring to be better at uh, is our relationship with, with iwi and the treaty partnership. Um, we're a charitable trust and not technically part of the Treaty of Waitangi at all, except that uh, it was built into our constitution in the 80s. So this idea that um, there are different worldviews and different ways of looking at um, the work that we do and understanding it. You know, many of our partner organisations overseas, the other, the other film and television archives, are predominantly commercial content. They're, they're feature films um, that were created in the, in the last century. And, that's not our predominant focus. Our predominant mm. focus is actually on, on films from iwi that, that show aspects of Māori life and Māori heritage and culture that, that um, you know, is very rare to find overseas. And, mm. and it forces you, in a good way, to think in a really different way about your practice um, that I think you know, is something that we should be a little bit proud of. We're still Kiwi, but a little bit proud of. Um, on an international stage. Hmm. I, it's, it's, it seems totally apparent to me as someone who's been adjacent but never um, sort of involved in the sector here that the way that the cultures are embedded, there is genuine biculturalism that uh, where indigenous peoples are treated with a, with a level of respect and engagement that is simply not apparent in any of the other places I've worked. And I've worked in places that have established indigenous cultures that are essentially obliterated. So I think that's something that uh, the world could absolutely learn from. All right, I want to end with a library, uh, Rachel. What what would you like to what would you like to have adopted outside of New Zealand? What bit of New Zealand would you like the rest of the world to say? That's great. We're going to do exactly that. Um, I spent a little bit of time sort of thinking about that when there was um, a heads up about one of the questions might be what. Uh, could be inspirational to people from other countries. Um, and I think, uh, like Rebecca, the um, relationship with iwi Māori is a particularly important aspect of what we do. He Tohu, which is the um, Te Tiriti and the Suffrage and the He Whakaputanga exhibition that opened earlier this year at the National Library, um, the archives, documents, but a partnership, uh, with iwi, with archives in the library, I think is truly inspirational. And if you haven't been to visit, please do. Little plug there. Uh, but alongside that, I think um, one of the things that we've done is the Māori subject headings. And again, that is a real partnership uh, where we have a, um, a group that works together um, from um, made up of iwi representatives, Te Rapa the Library Association um, for Māori librarians and National Library staff, and to actually create Māori subject headings that are then used in world catalogue records that can be um, searched online anywhere, I think that's the kind of thing that I would love to see other overseas institutions um, do with their Indigenous communities and their languages. So I think that's something that, although the Coomera doesn't like to say how sweet it is, I do think that that is something that we should be um, immensely proud of. Can you join me in thanking the panel?
and also like a little thanks for Philip who gave me all of the background and made sure that I actually knew what I was talking about it. So thank you, Philip. <laughs> um, I'd like to also thank the panel. Um, thank you so much for giving up, giving up your time for this. Um, we won't wait another 15 years to do this again. Um, and thank you to Keir for being such a, a warm, welcoming, um, honest and challenging host. Um, yeah. And judging by the Twitter feed, uh, it sounds like it, uh, it's, it's been very engaging and very well received. So thank you very much again. And uh, next session starts in about three minutes. So.